Hey, what's up guys? So, as promised, this is the inaugural episode of the new series I'm going to be doing called 90s Horror Movies You Must Watch. It's not a very clever name, but I mean, it's all I could come up with. And today's episode is about unnecessary sequels. Now, I say unnecessary sequels in jest because to me, they were very necessary. I love them. Pretty much all of them a lot, but they are very weird sequels to a lot of standalone 80s horror movies that in any other circumstance never would have gotten a sequel. So basically, from my perspective, it just seems like it was the end of the 80s, things were changing, VCRs were no longer just this high-end thing that not a lot of people owned and that people were renting along with their movies. Now it's basically like a microwave. They're in every household. It's the standard. People are going to theaters and drive-ins way less and just sitting at home and watching movies there. And also, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the 13th, are kind of getting old. The franchises have ran their course. And so all of these studios seem to start looking at all the properties they had and just trying to make cheap, low budget, direct a video, in most cases, sequels to them. And so what you got was a lot of times really weird, poorly executed on a technical level sequels that a lot of people hate, but that are actually a lot of fun. And these are a lot of the movies that I watched when I was really young and grew a pretty big attachment to. I've got five of them here, five franchises, not five movies. In some cases, there are multiple installments in these franchises in the 90s. And if you're familiar with these and I don't name some that you like, don't worry because eventually I will get to them but I'm keeping it to five right now. These are five of some of my favorites and without wasting any more time, I'll get to the first one, which is Pumpkinhead 2 Blood Wings. Now I'm willing to admit that a lot of the reason I love it so much is nostalgia. My mom rented this for me when it was a new release. That would put me at 10 years old when I saw this and it made me cry. I was a huge fan. I just remember seeing it in the new release section and becoming kind of obsessed with this movie, but it's not that good of a sequel. It does kind of shit on the lore a little bit of the first one, but there's a lot of fun to be had with it. It has a great cast, including Amy Dolan's, who will come up again later, Punky Brewster, whose name I can't really pronounce. I guess it's Salel Moonfry. I think it's easy to say that her parents were hippies. It also has Linnea Quigley in a cameo, Kane Hodder, and it was directed by Jeff Burr, who will also come up actually with the next movie, which is Stepfather 2. This is another one I love. I also love the original a lot. And this one is actually a pretty respectable sequel to the first one. It is a lot cheesier. They kind of give them the Freddy Krueger treatment and they do a little bit undermine some of the character traits that made the original stepfather so good, but it replaces that with a little bit of comedy. Again, a great cast. It's got Meg Foster from They Live, Carolyn Williams, who's of course Stretch in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and Terry O'Quinn coming back as the stepfather. There is a third one that I do not own and does not have Terry O'Quinn, but I would say still it's worth checking out, but it's even cheesier. Now the third one has a star from Pumpkinhead 2, Amy Dolenz, who I would consider a 90s scream queen, even though she wasn't in much, the things she was in were very good. And one of those is Witchboard 2. This is a sequel to the 80s Witchboard, it brings back the original writer and director, Kevin S. Tinney, who I'm a huge fan of. I love just about every movie he's made. This one is no exception. Something's falling back there. That's really creeping me out. But yeah, the cover art is dope. If you had Amy Dolan's in your movie, she needed to be on the cover. 
that was a mistake that Pumpkinhead 2 made. But yeah, this one, same thing. It's just a little more cheesy, a little more fun than the original. Lower budget, the original had basically a Hollywood Hills mansion as its setting, and it went to a lot of different locations. This one is mainly shot in an apartment that looks like it was probably in the opposite end of that California setting, which was pretty low rent. It also has the guy from Leprechaun 3, if you've seen that, as kind of our hero, if you can call him that which by the end is very debatable. With this one again, there is a third one, which I do not own. I'm pretty sure it hasn't made it to Blu-ray. I don't even think that one has made it to DVD and I've never seen it, but I do plan on checking it out eventually if I can ever find a decent copy of it or maybe a rip somewhere. You can probably watch it on YouTube. Quite a few of these you can probably find on YouTube if you look hard enough. Now for numbers one and two, we're getting into the big boys for me. And number two, in any other universe, it would have been number one, but there is one that outshines it a little bit for me. But anyway, number two is Children of the Corn. I'm specifically talking about mainly two and three, but also four. I've actually not gotten to five or six, which is the last two they made in the 90s, but I can speak on two through four. Okay, so Children of the Corn is my favorite Stephen King adaptation, probably. That's probably not a very popular opinion, but it's just true for me. I love Children of the Corn. It has a great concept. And part two and three, really build on the concept in a cool way. They are very cheesy. I'm starting to wonder how many times I've said cheesy in this video, but they kind of build on the concept of after part one happening, what do the remaining kids do? Part two is still set in the same town and part three brings it to the city. And both of these movies have really memorable moments. In part two, of course, there's the remote control wheelchair scene. And in part three, most of the practical effects are memorable. And that's because Screaming Mad George did these effects and they are amazing. There's one scene where a guy gets his head ripped off of his body and it's pulling his spine out, but the spine just keeps going. And it's like a 10 foot long spine or something. It makes no sense but visually it's hilarious and awesome. There's also a big special effects scene at the end using miniatures, which is one of the most hilarious special effects scenes I've ever seen. And if you watch it, you'll know why. They do have a Region B Blu-ray of this. I wish they would release them for the US because I'm not region free. So I own them on the beautiful Miramax Children of the Corn six film set, which isn't that bad. I mean, they're VHS transfers, I think, but I've seen a lot worse. They're not, they're not too compressed. This is probably a good entry point if you're wanting to dip your toes in the 90s horrors waters. 90s horror waters? Close enough. Cause you can find these in Walmart sometimes for like 12 bucks and it's six movies, and at least two of them are good. I will speak on four a little bit. Four is definitely a big drop in quality overall and entertainment value in general. I'd say it's worth watching if you like Children of the Corn, but it kind of branches off into a completely different backstory, and it tries to be a little more serious. And so what camp is in there is not as entertaining the practical effects are okay, but a little bit minimal. So I don't fully endorse it the way I do two and three because two and three are actually up there with the original to me. I love them all about the same for different reasons, but four is a drop off. I'll admit that. Watch at your own risk. And like I said, normally Children of the Corn would be number one, but there is one franchise that actually hits number one for me because these 90s direct-to-video sequels, I actually prefer 
over the original, and that is Scanners 2 and 3 and Scanner Cop and Scanner Cop 2. Now, don't hate me if you're a fan of Cronenberg in general or Scanners. I like Scanners. It's probably, though, his least David Cronenberg movie to me. And while it's good, these movies take that and successfully build off of what they were doing. They're basically superhero movies. Some of them almost border on horror and are more sci-fi action, but they're still loads of fun. They have tons of awesome practical effects. The Scanner Cop ones in particular had effects from John Carl Beekler, who I've said it before, he's my favorite special effects artist. Highly underrated. He did some awesome effects in these movies and along the way you get a lot of the campy stilted acting and they're just fun and if you've ever watched scanners and kind of felt like the premise was really cool but it fell a little bit short and the only really notable scene was the head explosion in the end this kind of in my opinion successfully builds on that premise takes it to the next level there are Tons of head explosions. Every movie has at least one. I mean, it's, they had to put a head explosion at least once in each of these movies, and they do. And it explores the different ways that these evil scanners can use their powers, and things escalate where they start controlling people through television, and by the end of it, there's one scanner running around, eating other scanners' essence to become a super scanner. The scanner cop movies, which by the way, look at this freaking vinegar syndrome set. It's beautiful. But anyway, the scanner cop movies have a consistent protagonist in Daniel Quinn. He does a pretty good job. Scanner cop two is the lesser of the two. Scanner cop one is where it's at. And out of these two, they're probably about equal, but I would probably give the edge to Scanners 3, but they're all worth checking out. And so there's the list, in my opinion, if you are curious to get into early 90s horror, this is a pretty good starting point. There's another good starting point that I might get to later, but if you liked 80s horror, all of these are sequels of standalone movies from that time that you'll be familiar with. Some people might get pissed off in some of the cases if they're too attached to the lore of them because some of them do get pretty absurd, pretty off the wall with them. But that's part of the charm of early 90s horror. That's the reason to love a lot of these is to not take it seriously. Don't overthink it if you can. I'll say if you can watch Pumpkinhead 2 Blood Wings and not get pissed at how much they stomp on the lure, you're golden. The other choices are reasonably consistent and just kind of add more camp and humor and lower production value and less skillful acting. But I mean, I say give them a shot because I grew up with these movies and I love them for what they are, which is dumb and silly and fun but let me know in the comments what you think if you like any of these movies if you're willing to check them out let me know thanks for watching hope you enjoyed it and until next time <laughs>